You don't want to be known as soft. You don't want to be known as small. You don't want to be known as easy to push around. You know, this is a tough game, and there's a lot of tough guys, and um, these guys are warriors out on the ice. Welcome to Between the Hash Marks from the Business of Hockey and the Goal podcast with Richard York and Les Kowalski. Let's start this episode. Welcome to Between the Hash Marks episode two. We're talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs. This is going to be an interesting episode. I'm really looking forward to this. The contracts with Austin Matthews and William Nylander. We're going to talk about Marner. We're going to talk about Babcock. We're going to talk about Lou Lamorello. We're going to talk about Kyle Dubas. This is quite the organization, isn't it? Like, they're doing some pretty progressive stuff. Well, so the Toronto Maple Leafs have fans all across the continent that it doesn't matter which arena they go to, there's always, like, a, a fan base that follows them. Like you see a, a patch of blue in the stands. Uh, they've always talked about that it's certainly the media center that uh, hockey players have a hard time with the level of media. Like, you got players... Well, you're under the microscope pretty intense. Like, look at Phil Kessel. When Phil Kessel was in Toronto there, he hated dealing with the media guys. Yeah. Is that they would always ask him questions and stuff like that. And there's all kinds of videos of him walking out on the media scrums because they were asking him personal questions about why a coach was fired and it would upset him. And it was just the way the media works there, right? Is that they they try and pull and poke and prod. And that's part of being under the giant microscope that is the Toronto Maple Leafs original six franchise team and the media hub a lot of uh, the hockey programming software any goal review all of that comes through toronto that's where hockey central is toronto so it'll be it'll be a fun episode we're going to talk about the maple leafs because they're they're talked about a lot so we might as well get our two cents in while we're at it we're going to talk about the shanna plan Brendan Shanahan and direction and vision is for the organization because, I mean, there's some from the outside looking in, a 33-year-old guy running one of the largest franchises got to kind of step back and go, are these guys completely out of their mind or is there like a plan? So yeah. I'll, I'll let you start on how you want to discuss this about Toronto. Okay, well, uh, obviously, first and foremost, we have to talk about the Shanna plan. Well, let's talk about how Shanna... Uh, Shanahan got into the position is is that he was the director of the player safety department all the fans know him because he would release those videos explaining why certain players got suspended for high hits or any of that kind of sort that's kind of where he got his name out there he was gave the good businessman image would be the word to use and uh, he was he was a sought after commodity after that once people realized that he can do something other than score goals and fight people. Uh, the Calgary Flames actually approached him and asked him about taking over their president of hockey operations department. Calgary at the time didn't have a president of hockey operations, but they were looking for one. In the end, they went uh, with Brian Burke, but Brendan Shanahan was one of those people that they interviewed first. Brendan Shanahan eventually uh, turned down the position and was given an opportunity to be the president of hockey operations for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I don't know the, I don't know the circumstances of why he didn't take the the job in Calgary. We'll probably talk about that when we get into a Calgary episode about the ownership's direction and how they went with their president of hockey operations, Brian Burke. But Shanahan was brought into the Toronto Maple Leafs media hub central focal point attention. He could handle it all. He's been a star hockey player. He's a Hall of Famer. He's got lots of goals, lots of penalty minutes. He was always a polarizing character, right? He could handle media. So good place for him to be. Now, the media has come across interesting phrases on how to use the plan that he put in place for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And so the catchphrase is the Shanna plan. And I like it. So we're going to use it. Hopefully we don't get sued for copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> So the Shanna plan was uh, his plan that he brought to ownership about how to structure the Toronto franchise because they were hamster on the wheel, spinning around, 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 right? They were always a playoff bubble team. If they got into the playoffs, Boston would knock them out. That, And just a heads up, the trend has continued. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to all those Maple Leaf fans. They kind of hate Boston. He was brought in to to change things up. You're at the top of the mountain there in Toronto. They're not the most successful franchise, but they're certainly the most talked about franchise. 
they are the focal point of the media. So he was brought in and he had to make his plan, his sales pitch to ownership and not only ownership, but he had to instigate it. And he did that by firing certain people, hiring certain people. One of the people that he first hired was uh, Lou Lamorello, who came out of New Jersey at that time. Lou Lamorello was the general manager for the New Jersey Devils for a long time. And he was a well-respected individual. I think he's in his 70s now. So he's he's been at the game for a long time. He's been a general manager for a long time. But Lou Lamorello, like, he's got some pretty pretty hardcore rules and standards that he brings into the Maple Leafs. And yeah. just the way he operates, the old school style, right? Well, they, they needed a new wave of uh, youth in Toronto. So the new wave of youth needed uh, structure. We always talk about the culture of a hockey team. Shanahan knows this. He was a hockey player, so he fully understands the idea of having a culture in the locker room. And now that he's a business into the business of hockey, which we're talking about, he knows that there has to be a culture from the top down. That you have to set those standards, you have to set those boundaries. Lou Lamorello's got some old school rules, which are kind of a little weird, but it was part of his character. It's part of who he is, right? That's just the standard he brings. It wasn't a secret, right? Yeah. So when Shanahan brought him in, he brought him in with these rules. As you were mentioning, he's got the, the standards and the weird stuff like that. Some of them are, you're not allowed to have a jersey number over a certain number value because he would define you as a football player then instead of a hockey player. So you had to keep your jersey numbers down. Hockey players usually like to use their, could be their birth year or something in significance. It could be just a superstitious thing as far as the number goes. Some hockey players don't even care. You know, whatever. Choose me a number. Whatever's available. Um, so bringing in that standard of limitations, any hockey player, young hockey player that got interviewed, traded, drafted, whoever had to talk to Mr. Lou Lamorello knew they were what they were getting into. That was a standard he said a long time ago. They knew that before they even stepped into the office with him. So that's one advantage of being old school and having that reputation, right, is that your reputation follows you. But it's also his resume, and that's part of why Shanahan hired him. Lou Lamorello was never the long-term solution in Toronto. They wanted to be new. They wanted to be cutting edge. He hired a couple of uh, good assistant general managers. One of them was Mark Hunter, who turned out really good. He was actually considered for the general manager position in Toronto after Lou Lamorello was let go. The other one was Kyle Dubas, but Kyle Dubas was brought in with the expectation that he was going to be the general manager, that it was his job to lose. He had to learn how to do it on a much bigger scale. We're going to go into Kyle Dubas in a lot more detail into the syndicate. There's a lot of juicy details into his history and stuff, but we're going to focus on the, the management of Toronto and the decisions that he made and the decisions that Lou Lamorello made. You know, let's take a look at uh, Austin Matthews for a second. He had his little incident down in Arizona with showing his butt to that uh, secu <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to that security guard. Everybody was talking about how this might cost him the captainship. I don't know. What's your take on all of that? Well, that happened in the off season before they officially named Tavares the captain. And I think Tavares being captain was a very smart decision. He's been a captain. He's a very well respected individual. Matthews would have been a good choice too. There's no doubt he's one of those leaders on that team. As far as the incidents that happened in the offseason, he's a kid. Austin Matthews is a kid. He was just handed a big paycheck. Suddenly he's a millionaire. You know, he's 20 years old or 21 years old. I could do worse things than show my butt to a security guard if somebody handed me $10 million. So as far as him losing the captaincy over that, I don't think it really played into it. I think because as we talked about earlier, Toronto is that big media hub that they're just looking for any little bitty detail or any little bitty story that they could blow out of proportion. And I think the Austin Matthews incident, nobody was hurt. There was no criminal offenses, you know, maybe some indec indecency in public, something like that, that he could be charged for, but very misdemeanor kind of stuff. You know, it's not like he was given a DUI or he got into a fight or anything like that, right? Like there was no, no serious criminal charges in the way of it. I think it's just a lot of media grab for that. He's to be a captain of an NHL franchise, you do have to hold yourself to a certain standard, and there's no doubt about it. But I honestly don't think that that should be held against him. He was just a kid. He was having some fun. Oops, probably shouldn't have 
mooned the security guard. So his contract, I think what we want to do is have a quick discussion on these three contracts. Like we we want to talk about Nylander, we want to talk about Matthews, we want to talk Marner. Why don't you get into some of the numbers and some of the, the differences on how these negotiations have went and how Dubas actually managed these three contracts. So I guess let's start. The first one that Dubas was dealing with was Nylander. Well, there's a lot of meats there with the Nylander contract. There's a lot of drama too. First and foremost, Kyle Dubas was handed the reins to the franchise after Lou Lamorello was let go after three years. He was brought in to mentor Kyle Dubas, and then eventually Toronto hired Kyle Dubas into this role. And I think part of the reason why he was hired into the general manager position at that time was, is well, the, ex- the excuse that Brendan Shanahan gave was is that was their initial timeline. When Lou Lamorello was brought in, he was told, you're only, here's a three-year contract. After that, we're going to move on. So right from the get-go, Shanahan had that plan of only keeping him in part-time to basically set a structure, set a culture, that kind of thing. Show um, the next general manager the ropes, which, as I said, Kyle Dubas was hired under the impression that he was going to take over this franchise as a really young individual. He's my age. He's 33 years old. Yeah. And I think part of the reason why they didn't extend Lou Lamorello was because these contracts were coming up and they needed somebody, a new fresh perspective on how to deal with new players in a new style of game and that they needed, they needed Kyle Dubas to run his math wizardry. And because Lou Lamorello, one of his rules that we talked about was is that if you don't have a contract and training camp opens, you don't play that season. And I know that Nylander, I mean, he didn't sign his contract till I think it was December, wasn't it? Like he missed, yeah, I the think tra- he missed training camp and he didn't nothing. Yeah, he, 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 was, he was like coming in halfway. Yeah, I think it's December first. It was it was within the last hour of the cutoff. Yeah, so they pushed her right to the end, which there's there's not a lot of wisdom in that. That was that seems a bit of a, a rookie mistake. I think there there's too much chicken. From what I've seen, he wasn't really following what Lou had put into place. If he had followed that standard where everything had to be signed before training camp, before the season was actually starting. Yeah, there's lots of time. He didn't follow that. You're saying he played chicken right to the very end. In the end, it was Dubas who actually blinked with Nylander's contract. Basically, Nylander got... Exactly what he wanted. Exactly what he wanted. Yeah. And that set a really bad precedent moving forward for the other two contracts. Exactly. So let's break down exactly what happened with Nylander. No, William Nylander on his entry-level contract, which is three years long. First year he spent on the farm team for the most part. He had a couple of call-ups. Second year of his entry-level contract, he was a full-time NHL player. He made the team, scored about 60 points, which is good. That's that's good for a player on an entry-level contract. Uh, the third season, he did the same thing. Is, is He scored another 60 points which is good. That shows a little consistency, right? No up, down, left, right. But it's a very, still a very small sample size on how to base a future contract on. There's other general managers around the league, like in Tampa is a very good example of it. And we'll get more into Tampa later on down the road. But Toronto really needed to set a strong precedent with all these big contracts coming up. I think at this point, Matthews had already signed his contract, which was a big one. You know, it was up over eleven and a half million. Tavares has already signed for over eleven million, and they had Marner coming up, and they knew that was going to be a big contract. But that's also part of why William Nylander's camp played chicken was is that they were afraid they they were going to be penny pinched and pushed out to make room for these big contracts. So the the game of chicken that happened really didn't work to Dubis's favor. Now he's definitely like. Toronto was out in the first round if they even made the playoffs that year. I can't remember. But they had a long off season. You know, it shouldn't take three or four months to sign a contract. Like that's, you know, it's like, okay, you take some time off, whatever, that kind of thing, right? But you you continue to pursue it. Now, this was the first big fish that Kyle Dubas had to deal with. And it didn't go well. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it went I well. I don't think it went well either. And it unfortunately carried over... That experience carried over into the Marner's camp because all Kyle Dubas did was that he gave Marner's camp ammo 
to use for his contract negotiations. Suddenly, they were okay playing chicken too, right? Because they saw Kyle Dubas blinked. So right. how so how long before he blinks for Marner? The breakdown for William Nylander's contract is he signed forty one point seven seven million for six seasons. That's not too bad when the when you break down the the cap hit and everything like that. It ends up at uh, six point nine ish. I think that's a little over value for sixty point seasons, in my opinion. But it wasn't wasn't too bad. What is bad is because William Nylander held out until December. As you said, he missed a training camp, he missed preseason, and he missed a big chunk of that season, right? The regular season. He missed at least a third of it. Any hockey player will tell you, you're playing catch-up. If you're injured for that long in the season, it takes a long time to get back into the flow of everything, right? Everybody is already bulletproofed into their workout routines, into their training, into their practices, William Nylander missed everything. There was going to be a drop off. Everybody knew it. He's still a young kid. He might have expected different things from like a Crosby or whatever, right? But this is still William Nylander. Because he pushed till December, he had a bad year. How would his teammates, what would they think of him if he waited out for so long? Well, it, it would certainly play on the mind a little bit. You know, like every hockey player knows is that there's a business aspect to the sport as well. And that's what they have to tell the media. They don't want to create, especially in Toronto, you don't want to create that drama right? That media, because, you know, one little wrong tweet and boom. That's right. It's all over the news. Poor Phil Kessel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, as far as your teammates and everything go, they all acted very professional about it. They know how the business side things work, but you can't tell me that doesn't play a little bit into how they view that player. William Nylander has uh, representatives, and I think his dad was one of them, who was an ex-NHL player. His dad was hard to deal with at times too, as far as the business side of hockey went. So uh, William Nylander, unfortunately, his representatives were playing chicken. And in the end, he did get what he wanted financially. He did not get what he wanted performance-based wise. And the team didn't get what they wanted performance-based wise. Because the first year was so shortened, they had to squish his cap hit for that first year into two thirds of the season. So in the first year, of that contract Nylander signed, he made $10 million. It was a $10 million cap hit because he didn't start playing until the first week of December, first or second week of December. And he was already behind the ball. So now you're throwing in a player that you knew was going to be behind the ball because he missed everything up until December 1st. No practices, no training camp, no preseason, no warm-ups, no nothing. You're throwing him in cold, ice cold, into the best league in the world. And you're paying him $10 million (laughs) to do it. (laughs) <laughs> oops <laughs> you may have wanted to rethink that but luckily toronto had the cap space to deal with that and only that year though so in year number two he gets his salary is base salary so the seven hundred thousand, and he gets an 8.3 million dollar bonus so there is no performance bonuses there is no nothing so year one 10 million bucks Year two, nine million bucks. Can't tell me he didn't get what he wanted. That's a pretty front loaded contract for a kid just coming out of an entry level contract. We just talked about Mar- um, Matthews down in Arizona there. You handed him $10 million. <laughs> Oops, he went and mooned somebody. No, but you get a kid who's coming in from Europe, ice cold physically and performance, and just every like there's a big mental aspect to the game, right? That you, you slowly train your brain for the pace of the game. And he was way behind. And unfortunately, he had a bad season, which makes that first year really bad financially. Absolutely. Right? So year two, it was lottery again, or you're you're gambling, sorry, gambling again. You know, $9 million for this kid who didn't do that great, who held out. You don't know what he's going to come into. And his year two was better. And this year, he's doing really well. So thankfully, he is doing really well. The contract is kind of balanced out a little bit. But the... The start of it was horrible from a management point of view. You know, William Nylander got what he wanted. Not only that, but he also got a verbal promise out of Kyle Dubas that he would not trade him. As we talked about, he was a little afraid that he was going to get squeezed and pushed out because of the big contracts coming in. Is that he was afraid that he wasn't going to be playing as a Maple Leaf. And he wanted a commitment out of him. They would not give him a paper one, thankfully. They, he's a kid. I can't believe that he would even ask for a no movement clause or anything like that. You work for that. 
you know, you don't, as a kid, you don't get handed that stuff coming out of your entry level contract. That's ridiculous. I don't even think Crosby got that. Mm-hmm. Right? Because mm-hmm. you, you, you just got to. And, you know, you got to work for it. And unfortunately, Kyle Dubas set the standard that you're going to get paid for future success than a history of success. Well, so, it's, a, it's a really dangerous precedent. Well, it's gambling. It's a very dangerous precedent in an organization like that. Yeah. And with William Nylander, it was a gamble. And there's bigger contracts coming with Marner. And he really needed to stick to his guns. And if it was me, it's easy, it's easy to manage a hockey team from a chair or from the couch. You know, we always talk about, you know, coaching from the couch. So it's easy. Armchair to, GMs. Yeah. Yeah. So, armchair GMs. Right. So I'm going to play GM for a moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. By no means could I do the job. I'm not implying I could do the job. But as a fan, you look at that and you think that Kyle Dubas should have been able to do it better from the outside looking in. Um, he knows details and stuff that we don't. But from the outside looking in, you were, you were hoping for sustained standards like Lou Lamorello has. He came with that resume of standards and rules and Absolutely. stuff that people knew about before yeah. they even got in there. So what Kyle Dubas is doing now as a young guy is he's building his own resume for future success now. And the first thing on his resume is going to be William Nylander contract. Well, it was, exactly. It, he was cutting his teeth for the first time and negotiating a contract like that, right? And I mean, it sets a bad precedent how that was managed. He's going to have to spend a really long time undoing what he had put forward. Right. Be, exactly. Like it's now out in the public. Now you've set a precedent and you can't undo that. No. It doesn't matter. Three years from now, yeah. you know, an agent can go back to that moment and say, you did this. And I don't think he thought through the consequences were to his own uh, career as a GM in negotiating contracts moving forward. Yeah. I don't think he saw that. The people around him, I don't know, maybe they gave him insights to that and he didn't follow and didn't listen through. But I think this is going to bite him in the butt down the road when you get another hot shot European Nylander coming in and saying, hey, you did this for these guys. That's my that's my take on it. Yeah. And, you know, he's he's going to have to spend some time undoing that, as you said. So carrying over into the, you know, and I will say, thankfully, Nylander is having a much better season and the contract is looking a little less painful. Right. Uh, certainly the first couple seasons were a bit rough. Everybody kind of says that with contracts, though. It is still gambling. Like in Edmonton, it was Leon Dreisaitl. People were astonished that he was signed for eight and a half million. You look at that now, anybody would take that deal. Absolutely. Right. Eight and a half million for Leon Dreisaitl. But still, as it's a gamble, is is that you're gambling for future performance coming out of your entry level contract like that? McDavid, you're paying for what you get. You know what you're getting with McDavid. Crosby, you know what you're getting. Nobody with was Crosby. expecting Drysaddle to actually hit 50 goals. Like nobody, no, no one was expecting him to achieve 50 goals. No, and he's certainly he's certainly making the contract look worth it now. Absolutely, which is which is good. That means he's grown into it, right? That doesn't work out for everybody. For players, some players just kind of coast because now suddenly they're a millionaire right out of their entry level contract and they don't know how to they don't know how to deal with it. Their performance drops off or whatever, right? It's still a gamble. And hopefully that they have enough people around them, enough professionals around them right. on the team and whatnot to motivate them. Because when you go into that locker room with a bunch of veterans and stuff, you're walking into a locker room of millionaires and you're no better than the guy sitting next to you. That's that team aspect of it, right? So hopefully some of that, that's where that veteran leadership in the locker room kind of spills over, right? Because Tavares is making a lot of money, right? But he is a very composed individual and he deserved the captaincy, you know, so good for him. Congratulations, Jonathan Tavares on the captaincy. He deserved it. Matthews, he's... Cutting his teeth in the, still cutting his teeth in the league now. He's doing really well this year. He hit uh, 30 plus goals again. So people are excited for him in Toronto. He's, he's a natural goal scorer. He's um, maybe not initially at first did he earn his contract. Um, but people knew that there was future success there. I would still call it a bit of a gamble just based on health wise. He didn't, you know, as we're talking to these three contracts, Matthew's contract was the first one signed because everybody knew. He had to be. Out of the three guys that were coming up that they needed to sign or wanted to sign, Matthews was number one. So they signed him, but they also signed up for the biggest chunk of change. 
he did not play a full season. I think his first year he played almost a full season and he scored 40 goals as a rookie, which is really good. Two years after that, he was playing 60 some games, which means there was there was an issue with health and consistency. Like how how can you pay a guy eleven point eight million dollars a season? I think that's what it is, isn't it? Over eight seasons. You don't know if you're gonna get a full season out of him. And as a kid, when he's younger and supposedly healthier, you know, he's only putting together 60, 70 game seasons. There was a health consistency issue there with Matthews that they overlooked for the performance that they got while he was on the ice. Kind of an interesting comment you said about Matthews and performance and the value. I just want to go back to Connor McDavid and a comment that he made. It was his knee that he had hit the goalpost with. Someone had asked him, why are you playing so aggressively? He said, this is what I'm being paid for. This is what the expectation from Mr. Cates is. So he went right up to ownership with that. This is what he's paying me for. Yeah. If you go back to Matthews, all these players even in Toronto, you're correct, they're young, but there's a certain expectation. Yeah. They have to be able to push themselves. So yeah. you're absolutely right. From a performance standpoint, they have to meet, they have to push themselves. Yeah. If they don't push themselves, they're going to run up against a major problem within the ownership group and within the organization. That's what you're being paid for. Yeah, absolutely. And Matthews is, I, I have no problem with the Matthews contract. You know, everybody knew as soon as he came into the league that he was going to get paid. You scored 40 goals as a rookie. You know, you're going to get paid. You know, Winnipeg was a lot more reserved with uh, Patrick Laine and how he was signed. He scored 40 goals as a rookie as well. 40 plus goals. I think he's got 44. His performance tailed off a little bit in the next two years, right? So they didn't have a big enough consistency to really pay him that kind of money. Whereas Matthews, he was hurt, but he was at least consistent. They paid him for what they figured he was going to be worth right off the bat. No different than a Crosby, no different than a McDavid. This is that they came into the league knowing they were going to be superstars. And they proved that they were superstars and there was no reason to doubt them. Nylander is a different story. He's a different tier kind of player. So coming in, they, they wasn't guaranteed he was going to be a superstar. He proved he can be a performer and that he can contribute to this hockey team. Mm-hmm. So they paid him for it. Marner as well. Marner was a good draft pick. So yeah, let's let's get into the Marner contract now because that really that we, William Nylander set up the Marner situation and once again it lasted all off season that they were playing chicken all off season. You said it yourself, Kyle Dubas blinked. So they were waiting for him to blink. Marner's camp was waiting for him to blink. Kyle Dubas's motive with the William Nylander contract was to get the cap hit to a reasonable point so that he had room to negotiate these future contracts. That's why there's a lot of performance bonus heavy first couple years in it. But he got a cap number that, I don't know what he was initially asking for, but at least it was something that he could work with, or he felt he could work with. Marner's was, Camp was asking for the moon and back. They were, they started at numbers higher than McDavid's. That's that's what I've heard anyway. And that's, because part of the negotiating process is you find middle ground. So they started high. The Toronto Maple Leafs started low, and the idea was to find a middle ground. You know, so to for it to take another six months to negotiate another big contract was ridiculous. The idea of it was ridiculous. The fans would have been so mad, hockey players mad, management mad, ownership mad. Like, you don't want that kind of drama again. You're in the focal point of the media circle. It's like a vicious circle. You're under an intense microscope. Exactly. Intense microscope. And is it might not be that big of a deal to the hockey players that William Nylander held out till December 1st. And even to some fans. It might not be that big of a deal to some fans. You know, he's back on the hockey team now. He's performing good. We all forgot about it, right? But the media will grab anything that they can grab and they make a big deal about it. So unfortunately, that was a big deal. And we're still talking about it now, right? And we're still talking about it now. So the, the Marner contract definitely uh, was impacted by the situation that happened with Nylander because... Dubas more or less lost the game of chicken. Just the timing of the contract and everything like that. If Dubas walked away from that negotiating table, he could have used the fact that Nylander wasn't willing to play ball and he could sit out all, all off season. He also could have traded him. You know, December the December 1st deadline, he couldn't play in the NHL after that. You know, it doesn't matter which team he was on. Kyle Dubas had the potential, had the option, I mean, to trade him in the off season, to trade him in the first month of the regular season, anything. Like he had options. It almost seems like he was trying to please the fan base and please ownership that 
or impress them by saying, hey, I can sign these three guys. Let's make it work. There is no other options available. And it was Lou Lamorello wouldn't have done that, which is maybe why they let him go. They wanted all these players. They wanted a fresh idea, fresh thinking. Maybe they wanted more of a people pleaser. I feel Kyle Dubas is a bit of a people pleaser. That may be because of his age group. That may be because of lack of experience. Who really knows? I don't personally know the guy. He seems like a really knowledgeable sort of individual. And I, he's only going to get better at this job. That's that's why he was hired. He was hired to do this job. Honestly, in the last offseason, you look at the wizardry that he had to do with the cap and all the moving and the cycling and everything that he did to get those numbers under the cap was magnificent. It was a magician working. And he did really well. So I give him tons of credit for that. And I can see him only getting better. Unfortunately, I thought this was a bit of a stumble right out of the gate. Marner eventually signed for $10.8 million over eight years, which is good. If he was going to sign for eight years, the camp was actually asking for Matthews money or more because he led the team in points the previous two seasons. His management, Marner's representatives, valued Marner's future success as continuing to be that point leader of the team, of the franchise. And so they felt that he was more of the spearhead than Matthews was. But that's, that's a cash grab. Definitely a cash grab. But Marner got paid. Good for him. Congratulations, Mitch Marner. The thing you have to take away from this is, is that the it was the day or two before training camp opened, right around that time period, that Marner called his representatives and said, stop dicking around. I want to be with my teammates. I want to be in training camp. And maybe that was because of what they saw, maybe that he saw in the Nylander situation where that he missed some time and Nylander was playing catch up the rest of the season, physically, mentally, emotionally, to try and get back into the swing of things. And Marner did not want to miss any of that. He did not want to miss training camp. He did not want to miss preseason. So he was, I think that's a good, very, very good character on Mitch Marner's part, that he took the initiative to call his representation. Well, and it's really quite a comparison between three different players signing three major contracts at at the same time, how each of them took such a different approach. Yeah, it was like three different ways of doing it. It's three ways of doing it. You look at what Dubis did with Nylander, I think that is going to haunt him for a really long time. Yeah. You know, and I think it's going to take a really long time for him to undo that. And from an optics standpoint, it just comes across as very weak and that he can be taken advantage of very easily you know whatever i want i'm going to get and i think it's a it's a very dangerous precedent to be able to set to move forward in dealing with other contracts that are going to be coming down the pipe at any point well what's going to work to kyle dubas's advantage moving forward is is that people do have limited uh, memories and limited contracts that they can pull from Sidney Crosby, if Crosby was to sign today, he'd be a $10 million plus player. He's making 8.7 now. He likes 8.7. That's a superstitious thing. That's his jersey number, which I think is fascinating. 87, 8.7 million a season. But when he signed, it was a percentage of the cap. McDavid's contract was a similar percentage of the cap because the cap keeps growing and whatnot. So as the cap keeps growing, they got an expansion draft happening in Seattle in the next year and a half. That is going to change the league, much like the Las Vegas one did. That changed the salary cap because to open a new franchise, you have to pump a bunch of money into the franchises, into the NHL. You actually have to buy your way in, which which uh, affects the cap hit. That means suddenly there's a bunch more revenue for the, each of the teams to divvy out and whatnot. There was a bit of a spike in the cap the first year the Las Vegas Golden Knights came in. So if there's going to be another spike and whatnot, it's going to affect contract layouts because every three or four years, a bit of a different landscape that they're dealing with based on salary cap and percentages over the years. I think we've pretty much covered the three contracts and the three players. Yeah, all of them are signed now. All of them are playing for the Maple Leafs and all of them are doing well. They're doing good. Babcock is out. We got a new guy in. Sheldon Keefe. Yeah. I know that you've got some pretty interesting perspectives. I think they're fascinating. So why don't you share your perspective on the whole Babcock saga? This has been part one of Between the Hash Marks on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Next week, we'll be posting part two of this one-hour episode, continuing our talk on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Thanks for listening to Between the Hash Marks from the Business of Hockey on the Goal, produced by PowerRoadMap.com. Till next week. Thanks for listening to Between the Hash Marks from the Business of Hockey on the Goal. Produced by the Power of Matt Podcast. Until next time.